That should be happening any, any moment now. So far, we've had the trunk jettisoned, uh, the slew to deorbit burn attitude, and again, just waiting for that deorbit burn to start. Hearing 10 seconds until the burn begins. And we do have confirmation that the deorbit burn has begun. This burn is expected to last about 17 minutes. So within the last 10 minutes, Dragon jettisoned its trunk and initiated the deorbit burn just seconds ago. That deorbit burn is now underway. Uh, we are expecting about 16 more minutes to remain in that deorbit burn. The burn in all is uh, slated to last about 17 minutes. And for these operations, NASA and SpaceX do closely coordinate with the United States Coast Guard to establish a safe a safety zone to ensure public safety and of course for the safety of those involved in the recovery options it, operations as well as the crew on board the returning spacecraft multiple notices are issued to the mariners in advance and during recovery operations and coast guard patrol boats are deployed to discourage boaters from entering the splashdown zones we do want to stress to the public the need to respect this safety zone. Recovering a spacecraft from the water is a hazardous operation and any other boats interfering increases risk to the astronauts in the capsule. And the teams are working to recover them from the water and the safety of those that come too close. So for the safety of the crew and your safety, we really do recommend you sit back and watch here as we'll be bringing you the very best possible views of our astronauts homecoming. And you can see some of those views right now from the recovery vessel, Megan. Like we mentioned er earlier, the deorbit burn is the last time that the four forward Draco thrusters will fire. Dragon Freedom has not yet entered Earth's atmosphere. This deorbit burn is what will line the vehicle up and put it on its final trajectory to the landing site off the coast of Jacksonville, Florida. Right now, Chell, Bob, Jessica, and Samantha are using their screens to keep tabs on the burn duration, which we were able to get a live view of a little bit earlier. Draco thruster firings and traje trajectory details like entry angle, capsule perigee, and how much distance remaining until the deorbit burn termination. Dragon is flying itself. Again, it's autonomous, so all the crew has to do is stay strapped in their seats and keep tabs on things. With Shell, Bob, Jessica, and Samantha ready to deorbit and splash down back on Earth, they'll be heading to one of seven targeted sites supported by SpaceX and NASA. All of these sites are located off the coast of Florida, either in the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic Ocean. Spreading the supported sites across multiple locations helps to maximize the return opportunities for this mission and future crews, lowering the chance that we'll have to wave off due to bad weather. And earlier today, NASA and SpaceX jointly selected prime and alternate splashdown locations off the coast of Jacksonville, which is our prime today and where um, the boat is currently staged. And the alternate is Tallahassee, Florida. The selection process works with a lot of different variables, including the space station's orbital trajectory, what landing sites are available and how favorable weather, how much free flight capability Dragon has for the trip home, and the sleep schedule for the returning crew members. We'll start with calculating daily return options based off of the space station's current orbit and Dragon's capabilities to maneuver and line up for re-entry. The time from undocked to landing at the primary site can vary from less than six hours to more than 39 hours. Getting home the quickest comes with some obvious benefits, but we always have to make sure that the crew, if properly rested, is properly rested for dynamic operations, preventing us from scheduling 20 plus hour days for them. Trajectory and ballistics experts provide the daily opportunities that would line up Dragon with seven landing zones and split them into what we call ascending and descending opportunities. 
Dragon uses its Draco thrusters after leaving station to execute a series of altitude lowering maneuvers and to line up with the selected primary site. It can also change to different alternate sites while in free flight if sudden weather moves in that we'll need to avoid. And weather is something that we're constantly looking at, making the final call to proceed about two and a half hours before the crew on docks. So for the Crew 4 return, we looked at a number of weather items. Some of the obvious ones are no rain or chance of lightning in the recovery zone, both for the safety of the crew inside the capsule and the recovery teams on the water. We're also looking for wind speeds less than 15 feet per second or about 10 miles per hour and relatively calm seas so we can safely execute recovery operations, which includes landing a helicopter on the recovery ship to fly Chell, Bob, Jessica, and Samantha back to Florida. Once Dragon began flying free, we had a number of additional checkpoints to either proceed towards the primary site, head to the alternate, or select a new zone based on real-time weather data. These checks happened all the way up until we're in the final hours before the deorbit burn, which is the last burn in the trip home and commits the Dragon capsule to re-entering the, at the atmosphere. And as we've mentioned, this burn is underway. We are hearing good calls that the burn is proceeding nominally or as expected, which is great news. If you're just now joining, the deorbit burn started just about six minutes ago. It's about a 17 minute or just under 17 minute burn. Uh, and we are just waiting to hear the call out for when it's complete for a normal burn. Uh, and that's what will give us that confirmation for Dragon Freedom. So we are six minutes into that burn, as you said. Um, it's about a 17 minute long burn. So um, we're continuing to progress in that burn, continuing to get good call outs that everything is going as expected. And so the, during this deorbit burn, this is the last time that those four forward uh, Draco thrusters will fire um, during this mission. So Freedom has not yet entered the Earth's atmosphere yet. This deorbit burn is really what will line the vehicle up and put it on its final trajectory to the landing site, um, which of course is off the coast of Jacksonville. So the crew continues to um, really head home after spending 170 days in space. Um, during that time, they completed 2,720 2, orbits of the Earth, and they traveled over 72 million miles. Um, it's really interesting to think about it in that perspective because the space station is moving 17,500 miles per hour, which means um, that they orbit the Earth every 90 minutes and the crew sees a sunset and a sunrise every 45 minutes. So when you're there for 170 days, you see a lot of sunsets, a lot of sunrises, and you travel a lot of miles, over 72 million of them, in fact. Yeah, that's a lot of miles, and that sounds pretty cool to see all those sunsets and sunrises. <laughs> Development of Dragon for crew started with Cargo Dragon. Dragon was designed from the beginning for flying humans to space, so much so that, it even, that even the first Cargo Dragon had a window on it. Now, before we could fly humans, our teams implemented a number of design upgrades to make sure that both Dragon and Falcon 9 are suitable for flying people, and then put both vehicles through thousands of tests to prove their safety. Now, Dragon is capable of carrying up to seven passengers to and from Earth orbit and beyond. It is the only spacecraft currently flying that is capable of returning significant amounts of cargo to Earth and is the first private spacecraft to take humans to the International Space Station. Dragon is fully autonomous, which means that it can basically fly itself, but also features full manual override capabilities in case of emergency. Now, standing at almost 27 feet tall from the bottom of the trunk to the top of the nose cone, Dragon is composed of two main elements. That's the capsule, which is designed to hold crew and pressurized cargo, and an unpressurized section known as the trunk. And for today, we have already jettisoned the trunk, uh, which reveals the heat shield on Dragon as it prepares to return back home to Earth. And there you can see the 27 foot tall Dragon vehicle. That top part there is called the capsule and below it with the black and white um, colors there is the trunk. The black portion of that are um, solar arrays. 
And you do also see that nose cone at the very top there. Um, following this deorbit burn, we will close up that nose cone as um, we discussed, but the nose cone does open for docking and remains attached to the Crew Dragon spacecraft. Um, and then it will close um, here following the deorbit burn. We are over halfway um, complete with the deorbit burn. We have about seven minutes remaining, continuing to hear good call outs, everything proceeding as expected in this deorbit burn. If you're just now joining us, the deorbit burn started around 1.01 p.m. Pacific time. It will last about 17 minutes or just under 17 minutes. And we are just waiting to hear the call out for a normal burn. Uh, and that will confirm the completion of the deorbit burn for Dragon Freedom. And prior to this deorbit burn, there was a series of other burns that took place. Um, one of those occurred uh, just a short time ago, and that was the uh, propellant wasting burn or prop wasting um, burn. And that really is to just get rid of the excess propellant that is not needed for reentry. Um, and it helps the capsule to weigh less um, ahead of the reentry sequence. And coming up after the deorbit burn, about 12 to 13 minutes later, we will begin to close the nose cone. Uh, speaking of, you know, Dragon's previous design, we used to jettison the nose cone, but for reusability purposes, we now keep the nose cone attached. Uh, so once we finish the final burn, which is the deorbit burn, we no longer need to use those thrusters, those forward bulkhead thrusters, so we can close the nose cone as it makes its way back down to Earth. And following the completion of the deorbit burn and the nose cone closing, um, the crew will then begin to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. There will be a blackout period um, where we will not be able to communicate back and forth with them. That does last just a few minutes and that is completely expected. That um, is happening because the plasma is building up around the vehicle, but the heat shield um, will do its job and protect the crew throughout that process. Um, and then once the crew has gotten to the other side of the atmosphere, we should have communication communications back with them and then we will see the drogue parachutes deploy then the main parachutes and then we'll see splash down just a short time after that um, really that's just about 40 minutes away from now we should see the the crew splashing down in the ocean so I'm excited for it I'm sure the crew's excited for it um, but we are nearing the end of this deorbit burn about five minutes remaining in it So to talk a little bit about those parachutes that are going to um, deploy the uh, the drogue parachutes slow the dragon uh, down from 350 miles per hour. Um, so that's still going pretty quick. But then once the main parachutes deploy, it will be it will slow down quite a bit more um, to less than 20 miles per hour. Just about four minutes remaining in the deorbit burn. So after those parachutes are deployed, um, we will see them be cut. There's a fast boat that goes out there, and that's really the purpose of the fast um, of that particular fast boat is to cut um, those parachutes, and that's really just to make sure that they don't get caught in the wind um, or is pulling the crew around. Um, so those parachutes will will be cut. So that's expected, um, and then after that, uh, a sniff check will be done by uh, one of the recovery folks um, and that's just to ensure that there is no um, vapors or anything that would pose a risk to the recovery personnel or the crew themselves as they egress the capsule. We are just a couple minutes away from the completion of the deorbit burn. We are just waiting for a call out uh, to confirm that.
We have about two minutes left in this deorbit burn. And next step after the deorbit burn will be the nose cone closing. It's very important to close that nose cone because it protects um, the docking mechanism and some guidance and navigation and control equipment. And so at this point, the heat shield is now pointed towards the earth and is really um, getting ready to do the heavy lifting of protecting the capsule. Um, and of course, more importantly, the crew inside from the over 3,500 degree Fahrenheit that's going to be exposed to as the Dragon capsule enters the earth as part of their recovery operations. So that will be coming up here shortly. We have just about a minute remaining in today's deorbit burn. Continuing to hear good call outs that the deorbit burn is going as expected. Dragon systems are looking good, and of course the crew is monitoring every step of the way, checking in. Um, they do have uh, iPads as well as the screens um, that they are able to utilize and, and look on the tablet as to how much time is remaining on the uh, deorbit burn. And we did just hear the deorbit burn is complete and nominal. Freedom, SpaceX, deorbit burn complete. Performance nominal, nose cone closure is initiated. Freedom copies, nominal, zero and burn, glad to hear it, and uh, nose cone closure initiated. Some news, nominal deorbit burn, and also heard the call out that the nose cone procedure is going to begin. So in the background, Dragon is currently inhibiting those forward bulkhead Draco thrusters that we just used to complete the deorbit burn, ensuring it's safe to latch the nose cone shut for re-entry. Also, the vehicle has initiated the Nitrox suit purge. This will help keep Chell, Bob, Jessica, and Samantha cool and comfortable during re-entry. And you do see that nose cone beginning to close here on your screen. At this point, that nose cone is closing and protecting the forward hatch for re-entry. Chell, Bob, Jessica, and Samantha are using their screens, as we mentioned, to monitor the locking of the nose cone, which is done by a set of hooks. And this nose cone sequence is about 12 to 13 minutes long. So we've got about 11 minutes left for that nose cone to officially complete its clicking. And good call outs. So now we're really just in a waiting period right now before we begin that re-entry period. Um, that's coming up in just a few minutes uh, when the crew themselves will re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and as we discussed earlier, the heat shield will really be protecting the crew during this time period. The temperatures can reach um, 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit, but the heat shield was created to protect the crew during this uh, dynamic operation. And as they enter through the atmosphere, it's really going to slow them down. Um, right now, they're going um, a little more than 17,000 miles per hour, but as they re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, um, once they come out on the other side, um, they'll be going much slower, and then the parachutes will just continue to slow them down from 350 miles per hour to a little less than 20 at the time that they splash down. And also during re-entry, uh, there will be a period where, you know, that heat builds up around the capsule. There will be plasma that builds up around the capsule. So there will be a blackout zone, which is normal, uh, lasts about, about six minutes long. 
Um, and then once we get through that blackout zone, then we'll um, confirm confirmation. We'll confirm confirmation with the crew to make sure that to make sure that they still um, can communicate with the ground here in mission control. And so we continue to progress through the nose cone closure process. At this time, the hooks are closing. Um, there are two sets of six hooks, so 12 hooks total that need to close to secure the nose cone and protect that critical equipment. So we are getting a view on the left hand of your screen of Mission Control in Houston, Texas. Um, that is where our flight controllers and the flight director monitor the International Space Station 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have a variety of different console positions that specialize in different parts of the International Space Station, um, and they all work together as a team to keep the space station flying. It's now been flying for over 20 excuse me, it's now been, it's been continuously occupied now for over 20 years. And on board the International Space Station right now are seven human beings, of course, Crew 5 that just um, arrived last week, as well as two Russian cosmonauts and NASA astronaut Frank Rubio, who arrived on a Soyuz vehicle. Um, but with Crew 4 departing earlier today, it brought the uh, population from 11 crew members down to seven. And that will be the complement um, for the next uh, few months. And we've been keeping the International Space Station pretty busy with NASA crew flights being about every six months. Um, so it's been pretty cool to, to see, um, you know, a, a different group of astronauts every six months being able to, you know, perform research and science on the International Space Station. And that's a really great point. The International Space Station truly is an orbiting laboratory. Um, crew for contributed to hundreds of science experiments while they were on board the International Space Station. Crew 5 will continue um, some of those science investigations as well as start new ones. Um, and what I love so much about it is many of those science investigations have direct implications to us here on Earth. If you are interested in learning more about that, you can check out the uh, Benefits for Humanity. The 2020 version was just published here recently, and you can find that on NASA.gov. So if you are just tuning in with us, Crew 5 has undocked from the International Space Station and the deorbit burn has taken place. Um, that was all successful and... Freedom, SpaceX, nose cone secured for entry. Freedom copies, we see
We got some great news. The nose cone sequence is complete, meaning that the nose cone is now officially closed. As we begin the second half of entry, Dragon is now beginning to inject cooled nitrox into the air, be being delivered to the suits worn by Chell, Bob, Jessica, and Samantha. Now, again, this is what will allow the crew to remain comfortable while external temperatures reach 3,500 deg degrees Fahrenheit. Now, the heat shield is pointing forward, leading the capsule to the landing site. And speaking of the heat shield, Dragon's primary heat shield is comprised of PICA 3.0, which stands for Phenolic Impregnated Carbon Ab Ablator. First generation PICA was first developed by NASA for studying and sampling comets within our solar system. And SpaceX partnered with NASA to develop Pika X, which was the second generation product used on all Dragon 1 CRS missions that successfully resupplied the space station on 20 missions. Then Pika 3.0 was developed specifically for use on Dragon 2 crew and cargo with enhanced structural and thermal properties that optimized the heat shield and drove down costs and mass. Now, the remainder of the Dragon capsule is comprised primarily of a SpaceX proprietary ab ablative material. It's another class of thermal protection, which is lighter weight versus PICA and protects the underlying composite material or structure during re-entry to ensure the structural capabilities are maintained. And while Dragon will experience temperatures well over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit during peak reentry conditions, the characteristics of the TPS or thermal protection systems coupled with the EGLIS, environmental cooling and life support system in the pressurized interior will, interior will help ensure that Chell, Bob, Jessica, and Samantha stay cool and comfortable during all phases of reentry through splashdown. Now, after Crew Dragon Freedom has re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, a series of parachutes will deploy, and that'll slow the crew's descent. Now, first will be the two drogue chutes, followed by the four main chutes to guide Dragon to its first contact with Earth since launching in April earlier this year. Dragon will automatically deploy these parachutes when different pressure and positioning sensors on the capsule detect that they are at the right speed and altitude. Vehicle velocity at Drogue Deploy is approximately 350 miles per hour, as we mentioned earlier, and those Drogue parachutes do deploy at about 18,000 feet above the water. Now, vehicle velocity at Main Deploy is approximately 119 miles per hour and deploy at about 6,500 feet. Vehicle velocity at water splashdown is approximately 16 miles per hour, and the highest G load the crew will experience during reentry is approximately 3 to 5 Gs. So next up, we are looking ahead um, towards the comms blackout that we discussed as the crew re-enters the atmosphere. This is expected and can last a few minutes long, uh, but once the crew is on the other side of the comms blackout and we do regain um, communications with them, uh, the drogue chutes will deploy. We are tracking the that first set of uh, drogue the first set of parachutes, the drogue chutes, to deploy around 1.51 p.m. Just a minute later, the main chutes will deploy, and then about three minutes after that, the moment we've all been waiting for, we'll see crew for splashdown off the coast of Jacksonville, Florida. We are still tracking approximately 1.55 p.m. Pacific time today for that splashdown. And so at this time, all of the recovery teams are in place. Um, those fast boats that we were talking about earlier have deployed, and we really are getting ready to bring this crew home. Everything has proceeded as expected with the deorbit burn. The nose cone is now deployed. And the next big milestone that we're looking towards is that communications blackout. Again, we have an awesome live view inside of the Dragon capsule, seeing our crew 
And again, we've mentioned this, that they use the displays to monitor the activities that are happening with Dragon. But Dragon is flying autonomously, so they really just get to sit back and just monitor. So we did mention that we are looking towards entering a period where we will have a communications blackout with the crew. Um, that is because of the plasma that's building up, um, because we're using the atmosphere itself to help slow us down. We're going about 17,000 miles an hour, um, and we do need to slow the crew down before they re-enter the Earth, before they splash down. Um, and as they re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, um, that will definitely happen. Um, they'll be going about 350 miles per hour once they enter the other side of the atmosphere. Um, and as we said, they'll be going less than 20 miles per hour at the time of splashdown. Freedom SpaceX for entry briefing. And uh, Freedom standby. Rachel, I have no deltas from the previously briefed tablet timeline. Dragon systems are looking healthy and ready for entry. And we have no updates for splashdown. The recovery team is ready to support and weather's looking good. How copy? You copy all, Arthur. We're uh, looking forward to splashdown and, and uh, seeing the recovery forces. crew there chatting with the core here in Mission Control Hawthorne. That's what you're seeing there on your screen. We did get to see a live view of the crew in their seats in the Dragon capsule as they're making their way back home. Uh, the suit's primary function is to protect the crew in the event of a cabin, cabin depressurization. And if that were to occur, the suit would inflate to provide a habitable environment long enough for the crew to return home. And there you can see them there. Right now they are also uh, filling their suits with some cool nitrox that actually helps keep them cool. The suits are kind of an extension of the Dragon capsule. Uh, it's almost like they have their own personal AC unit on them. And the suits are flame resistant materials on the outer layer. Also protects the crew in the event of a fire. They are custom tailored single piece suits. This means that the helmet, gloves, and boots all remain attached together. And the helmet that we were able to see on the screen that they're wearing is 3D printed nylon and does have a visor that pivots open. And then they do have quick disconnects or QDs uh, on the right thigh, which mates to an umbilical on the seat. And that is what provides the air for ventilation, oxygen, nitrox for pressurization, and allows the electronics to be connected all from a single location on the suit. Again, if you're just now joining us, we are live watching Crew 4 return home to planet Earth from the International Space Station. We've had the deorbit burn, we've jettisoned the trunk for the vehicle, and the nose cone has closed on Dragon Freedom. And again, another live view inside of the capsule there. And SpaceX from Freedom, tablets to secure restraints are tightened and our visors are down. We are ready for entry. SpaceX copies for tablets, restraints, and visors. Please confirm that tablets are stowed with the loops as provided on the satchels. Copy, welcome.
So we are now less than 20 minutes away from splashdown. And again, we are going to be entering that blackout communication period. But once we are on the other side of that, things will happen pretty quickly. The drug shoots will deploy. And uh, SpaceX Freedom tablets are all secure. SpaceX copies. Thank you, Freedom. And at this time, we're just over five minutes from predicted calm blackout. We will see you on the other side at 2049. Okay, cop from uh, LOS, and we'll see you on the flip side at uh, 2049. So you did hear those words from the ground up to uh, crew four, namely Chell Lindgren, just ensuring that the tablets are stowed and secured in the proper positioning ahead of the communications blackout expected now less than five minutes from now and really in anticipation of reentry and then splashdown. Um, as we were saying, the um, Pace is really going to pick up once we are through that communications blackout. The drogue parachutes will deploy, and then the main parachutes will deploy, and then we will see the crew splash down. After that, we'll see the fast boats head out to the crew, inspect it, make sure everything is looking good and the integrity of the vehicle is as it should be, um, and those main parachutes will also um, be cut. And then the recovery personnel will work on securing the vehicle and bringing it it into the recovery vessel and then after um, some private medical checks with the crew we should see the crew egress a short time after that um, so again we are expecting the splashdown to occur at 155 Pacific time so just a few minutes from now um, and we are coming up on that communications blackout that as that is as expected as well yeah, and this blackout period is basically when the vehicle is entering back into the Earth's atmosphere. It is heating up and plasma is building around the capsule, which prevents communications with here uh, in mission control. Uh, it lasts about six minutes. It is nominal. Uh, and once we get through that blackout period, we do uh, make sure that the crew can communicate with the ground here in mission control. And we do have um, the NASA plane, the WB-57, which is up in the air, and it's equipped with some imaging technology that will be able to get pretty much the first views of the Dragon capsule on its return back to Earth. So we are getting some of that footage right now. Um, we are anticipating that communications blackout and loss of signal here shortly. This is really the beginning of that period where the crew themselves um, will be re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. And at this time, the Dragon is working through a slewing maneuver, uh, which means that the Dragon is helping to orient itself in the proper orientation ahead of the reentry of the Earth's atmosphere. Again, we're just a couple of minutes away from that anticipated blackout period. We are just about a minute away from that communications blackout period. Again, it should last only about six minutes long. Uh, and this is what happens when uh, the vehicle begins to heat up as it's entering back into the Earth's atmosphere and builds up a layer of plasma around the vehicle. Again, this is nominal. Um, and we will uh, establish uh, communications once the vehicle is through that period.
So we are hearing that the dragon is beginning to hit um, the Earth's atmosphere here, really at the upper limits of the atmosphere. Um, so that's going to help to slow the vehicle down quite a bit, uh, but we are now seconds away from the anticipated loss of signal. Standing by for confirmation that we are in the communications blackout. And as we await that confirmation, you can see the crowd is starting to grow um, here in Hawthorne uh, behind the Mission Control Center here. Looks like folks are trying to get a good view as we anticipate splashdown here in a little less than 15 minutes. Yeah, we do get pretty excited when we are bringing crew back home. It is pretty exciting to watch them as they touch back down on planet Earth. They've been out in space for about six months now. Again, we are currently in the comms blackout period. This is nominal, lasts about six minutes. Uh, we are just a few minutes away from passing through this blackout period. Now at this point, we are entering a communications blackout period, which lasts approximately six minutes due to plasma formation around the spacecraft. Now during this time, no vehicle telemetry is re received by mission control or the recovery team, and no external commanding of the vehicle or voice communication is possible. Now, as a reminder, Dragon is designed to fly itself, so during re-entry, the vehicle will be slowing down from orbital velocity, which is approximately 17,500 miles per hour. Now, the top temperature Dragon will experience upon re-entry is about 3,500 3, degrees Fahrenheit. And again, the blackout period is expected to last about six, maybe up to seven minutes long. And we are just about uh, four minutes remaining in this anticipated communications uh, blackout period. And during this reentry phase, the team, um, the crew rather, is going to be uh, experiencing a uh, deceleration. And the team here on the ground is going to continue to monitor that, make sure that everything is proceeding as expected. But once we're on the other side of this communications blackout, that's when we'll begin to see the parachutes deploy, beginning with the drogue parachutes and then following with the main parachutes. And then we'll see splashdown and then the recovery process uh, to get the crew onto the recovery vessel and then out of the capsule will begin. And we did mention the high temperatures that the vehicle is seeing during this blackout period. So there is nitrox flowing through the suits that the astronauts are um, in, and that helps keep them cool while the vehicle is getting very hot on the outside. So we are getting our very first views there from the WB-57 of the capsule as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. Um, those views coming from an infrared camera that is on board.
So the team will continue to track Dragon as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. We now have about three minutes remaining in the blackout period, but again, the WB-57 that is deployed is getting those views of Dragon already. Once the expected blackout period is over, the Corps here in Mission Control will attempt to establish communications with the crew. So you may hear some call-outs checking in with the crew. Uh, and they will make that call-out until the crew does respond, which will confirm acquisition of signal. We have about two minutes remaining in the anticipated period of uh, communications blackout. Now, it's not an exact science. There might be some variation that occurs. Uh, we might hear from the crew a little earlier the, than we expected or potentially a little bit later. Um, but we are all on the edge of our seats eagerly awaiting um, to hear from the crew. So far, everything looking good. Continuing to get those views from the WB-57 of Crew Dragon as it uh, continues to make its way closer and closer to splashdown. Freedom, SpaceX, Comtrack. SpaceX, three thousand you loud and clear. Coming through 30 kilometers altitude. Copy and concur. Expect to automated shoot deployment. Freedom copies. We'll be monitoring. And HEPS is converged. Expect nominal shoot deployment altitude. Three copies. Looking for nominal shoot deployment. Well, Jesse, it is absolutely phenomenal to hear from the crew on the other side of that communications blackout period. We are continuing to get these great views from the WB-57 high altitude aircraft, providing that thermal imagery. Um, we did even see the tail of entry of the vehicle, and it's just absolutely um, beautiful to see that. So we also heard a We did hear a call up to the crew that um, they are expecting the automated drogue deployment. So we're, we're just standing by for confirmation that Dragon's shoots have deployed. And there will be a set. Freedom SpaceX, brace for drogue window. Bracing for drogues. Or here communicating with the crew, giving them a heads up that they should feel the drug shoots deploying here shortly, followed by the main shoots just about a minute later. The, the drug shoots do help to slow the vehicle down to about 350 miles per hour, whereas the main shoots will deploy, uh, after the main shoots deploy, it will slow the vehicle down even more, and by the time that the vehicle splashes down, it should be around 16 miles per hour. And there's those drug shoots, and you can hear the crowd here very excited to see them deploy. Shoot descent rate nominal and visual and two healthy drugs. Freedom copies. Very 
cool view of Dragon with the two drogue shoots. We are just anticipating the main shoots to deploy here shortly. As you can see there, the main chutes have deployed, slowing the Dragon vehicle down significantly, down to approximately 119 miles per hour. Freedom is 1,000 meters. Copy, 1,000. Now, Dragon has saved all propulsion systems and is now terminating the nitrox suit and cabin purges and is beginning to increase. 800 meters. Copy, 800. Dragon is beginning to increase pressure in preparation for landing. And mission control, the mission control team here in Hawthorne is reporting the precise landing coordinates to the recovery team. So we did get that confirmation on the main shoots. 600. The crew is now 600 meters away from splashing down. We do expect splash down in about two minutes from now. Landing in water is simpler, therefore more reliable, and it provides more margin against unlikely parachutes. Copy, four. Provides more margin against unlikely parachute issues. We had to learn how to make Dragon waterproof. But once you do, it is a rinse, review, and reuse type of process. And we are just about a minute away from splashdown of the Dragon vehicle back onto planet Earth. And hearing good callouts of the altitude of Dragon. Uh, Freedom's at 200 meters. We're bracing for splashdown. Copy, brace for splashdown. And again, that descent rate is as expected here. Pretty soon, we should be able to see the view of the ocean come into view as Crew Dragon Freedom, with four astronauts on board, prepares to splash down after spending 170 days in space after launching on April 27th. Welcome home, crew four. Great view watching Dragon splash down back on planet Earth. Now, as you can see on your screen, we have a visual confirmation for a splashdown of the Dragon spacecraft. Dragon Freedom has returned home, and NASA astronauts Chell, Bob, Jessica, and ES. Freedom, we are water uprighting and stable one. Copy Freedom. We see stable one. You are go for four decimal eight hundred. And on behalf of SpaceX, welcome home. Thanks for flying SpaceX. And uh, SpaceX uh, from Freedom, thank you for an incredible ride up to orbit and an incredible ride home. Glad to be back.
as you can see, Dragon Freedom has returned home, and NASA astronauts Chell, Bob, and Jessica, and ESA astronaut Samantha are back on Earth after an approximately five-hour return journey from space. The SpaceX recovery ship and team has been waiting for Dragon Splashdown, and they will now make their way to the Splashdown location. And we did hear the call out that the vehicle is in stable one. That's the configuration that we are hoping for. Stable one means it's in the ocean upright as expected. And you can see that exactly on your screen here. So the teams have been ready and waiting about three nautical miles away. So it's going to take them about 30 minutes or so to make their way to Chell, Bob, Jessica, and Samantha inside. Um, but about a minute and 30 seconds after um, the landing, Mission Control Hoth Thorn um, will give the go for final approach and the safe approach. Um, and then about two minutes after landing, the approach boat will begin those inspections that we discussed earlier. Um, that's just to ensure that everything is as expected with the vehicle. Next Dragon, complete with waiting for. SpaceX copies Dragon 4 awareness. Com is a little bit choppy, but we copy that you are complete with four decimal 800 and awaiting recovery personnel. I will provide an update on recovery forces in a couple minutes. How copy? Standing by. And Mission Control here in Hawthorne did give the go for that approach and recovery. And so here shortly, we should be able to get some views of the fast boats as they approach uh, the Dragon Freedom with the crew still on board. Freedom, SpaceX is go for recovery personnel to approach. Expect personnel alongside within the next couple minutes. Okay, copies. Good to see some friendly faces. And there you are getting a view of those fast boats as they approach the vehicle. They will essentially be doing some safety checks, making sure that all the ordinances and hypergalls are um, not present or in the area immediately around the vehicle. And they'll also perform an, ex an inspection of the capsule itself to make sure that integrity-wise it is looking good. You are seeing that very first fast boat approach the vehicle there. And they really want to do these inspections to make sure that everything is looking good before they do hoist it up into the recovery vessel. So it will take a little bit of time before we do see the crew egress or exit the capsule. We're shooting for less than an hour to bring the Dragon onto the recovery ship and open the hatch to egress. Once these checkouts are complete, you'll see a member of the recovery team actually climb on board the capsule. Freedom SpaceX for camera configuration. And go SpaceX. We are looking for permission to come on board via the display camera view only. Okay, you're welcome aboard. 
And Freedom, we are back on board with the display cam. Recovery personnel are all alongside. Okay, cut me off. Thank you. <laughs> and getting some waves from the crew on board Freedom post splashdown. Looks like they're doing pretty well. First time feeling. Uh, gravity in 170 days. <laughs> it looks like they're waving uh, to the world, technically. Uh, the crew will remain in their seats um, all the way until they are brought on board the recovery vessel. Now, we do expect to hear some words from NASA's Brandy Dean, who is actually on the recovery ship and was able to witness the reentry and splashdown of Crew Dragon Freedom. Brandy, if you're able to hear us, can you tell us a little bit about what it was like to witness four humans return to Earth after their mission aboard the International Space Station? Sandra, it is a gorgeous day for a smackdown. Um, I hope they're a little rougher than they've been in the past, but it's still a, it's a gorgeous, it's a beautiful day. Um, watching the capsule down, um, the, the uh, parachutes were just throwing the sun behind them. It was gorgeous. And so we are now underway and making our way towards the back. Um, the team here on the boat was so excited. There were cheers. We heard the um, double room as it answered and got to see it, the uh, throw shoot in this in this way and way and then something that could way down. So it's been a really great day so far. We're looking forward to seeing the crew here on board the ship. That's wonderful to hear, Brandy. Can you tell us a little bit about what the crew is doing and has done to prepare for this moment from your perspective as you've been on the recovery vessel? We've got you, Brandy. Here, I'll, I'll repeat it. Freedom, SpaceX, Hypergol sweeps, and unfired, or, unfired ordnance checks nominal. The rigging is in process. Progress, approximately two five minutes until capsule lift. Stand by for PMC with SpaceX flight surgeon. Okay, Freedom copies all. Hypergol checks are passed, uh, and we're about 25 minutes out. We're standing by for PMC. So, Brandy, if you're still with us, we did just hear that all of those hypergall checks went as expected, and we can see um, that the rigging has begun. I'm sure you have a much better view of it yourself on the boat, but can you tell us a little bit more about what the crew on the boat is doing to get ready for the next steps to bring the capsule onto the boat? And it sounds like we may have lost uh, Brandy. They are out at sea, so communications can be a bit spotty. We might be able to join back with her um, a bit later. But you are seeing right now um, someone on the capsule. They are doing what is called rigging. You see that they're tossing um, some different equipment up to them. And that's to ensure that the vehicle is ready. Freedom, SpaceX, I will be privatizing Dragon to Ground now. The next call you hear will be from the SpaceX flight surgeon on the recovery vessel. Thank you. 
And so those call outs about a private medical conference just to ensure that the crew is all feeling healthy um, and if there's anything that they may need medically wise once they do get on the boat. Uh, that is, of course, privatized for medical um, and person personal reasons. Um, but we are continuing to get really great views here of the rigging process. As I was saying, this individual is working to secure Dragon and enable it to be lifted onto the recovery vessel here in just a short time from now. And so once this process is complete, the next steps will be to hoist up Dragon and place it onto the boat, onto the platform. Um, and then that platform itself will be moved so that the crew can egress a short time after that. And then once the crew is on the boat and back inside of the capsule, they will, will board helicopters that are on the boat to bring them back to Ellington Field, which is near the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. And then they will bring European Space Agency astronaut Samantha Cristofredi um, back to Europe. And it sounds like we do have Brandy back with us. So Brandy, if you can hear us, can you tell us a little bit about what the crew on the vessel is doing to prepare for the capsule to be placed um, onto the boat? We did see the, the rigging that was taking place, but um, I'm sure you have a much better view from your perspective. Of uh, medical tests, scientific tests, and a lot of exercise to get them reconditioned and, and 
you slide back in gravity again. Um, meanwhile, Samantha will be going back to Europe. Uh, she'll, she'll leave pretty much right away once they get back to Houston. Thank you so much, Brandy, for that insight and sharing your firsthand experience of what it was like to witness splashdown from the recovery vessel. We really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us, but we'll let you get back to it and enjoy your time out there. Thanks, guys. And as recovery procedures continue as expected, um, we did have a splashdown that occurred at 1.55 p.m. Pacific time this afternoon. And you do see a wonderful photo on the left hand of your screen of that splashdown with the main parachutes all deployed. Really the moment that Crew Dragon Freedom touched Earth again for the first time in 170 days. So we do see the recovery vessel continue to approach the Crew Dragon Freedom vehicle. You are seeing on your screen a live view inside of the Dragon capsule with our crew patiently waiting in their seats. They will remain uh, harnessed into their seats until uh, the hatch is actually opened on the Dragon vehicle. And we did see the rigging process that was taking place a short time ago, and now we're getting another view of it here. Um, that person on the capsule is, is called the rigger, and they are working to secure Dragon to rigging hardware to safely lift it up and out of the water. And that will be done using that A-frame, um, which is the boxy frame that you see um, towards the back of the boat there. We are getting some pretty great views with this being in the daytime. Uh, we have splashed down in the nighttime where it's a little bit harder to see, but today we've got some light and get to watch the process pretty clearly here. Looks like a really beautiful day out there in Jacksonville. <laughs> Now, I am hoping that we will have the chance to see the rigger jump off of the vehicle. That's always <laughs> one of my favorite parts. We are now excitedly awaiting the recovery of our Dragon spacecraft with NASA astronauts Chell, Bob, Jessica, and ESA astronaut Samantha inside. Dragon has already autonom autonomously completed several steps to save itself following splashdown. Now, for those of you just joining us, the mission has gone smoothly so far. Dragon successfully splashed down in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Jacksonville, Florida at 1.55 p.m. Pacific time. Approximately five hours before splashdown, Dragon autonomously undocked from the International Space Station and completed a series of departure burns. The, the, jet, the trunk was then jettisoned and the final burn, the deorbit burn, was completed to place Dragon on a trajectory toward Jacksonville, Florida.
Dragon successfully re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, followed it by deployment of its parachutes to slow the spacecraft down to a gentle splashdown. And we saw that moments ago, um, just a few minutes ago, rather, uh, and we had really gorgeous views of it. So we're now following the final part of Chell, Bob, Jessica, and Samantha's journey as Dragon is going to be lifted out of the water and placed on the recovery boat. Upon detection of landing, Dragon autonomously releases the main chutes to prevent wind from pulling the spacecraft. Dragon then uh, automatically saves any pyrotechnics still present on the vehicle and may automatically perform additional minor system reconfigurations. The astronauts remain seated and in their seats and in their suits as well at this point, but the onboard air conditioning keeps temperatures in check inside of the spacecraft and the communication systems on board remain powered so that the crew can continue to communicate. And we did see that motion of the A-frame as it was getting ready to lift the capsule up and out of the water. Now SpaceX does have two fast boats in the recovery fleet, uh, which have moved to the splashdown point already. Um, they were followed by the main recovery vessel, which is really getting ready to lift the vehicle now at this, at this point. So those two fast boats do have a very specific role. The first is to a the first approach is focused on immediate safety inspection of the capsule integrity and checking for any presence of hypergolic propellant vapors, ensuring that it is safe for the recovery vessel to approach the Dragon spacecraft. All of those checks performed well. And once the spacecraft is cleared for full approach, the team begins rigging the capsule for water recovery by the recovery ship. That process is underway um, and just wrapped up. And then the second boat is really responsible for parachute recovery and serves as a redundant boat to the first. We'll also see a team member on a jet ski helping to gather up the now detached parachutes. And it looks like um, they may have already completed that process. I'm not seeing them. They might be just off the screen. Now it took a little over 10 minutes for the recovery crew to complete their safety checks. And once they did complete that, the- Freedom SpaceX contract. Working is complete. Please brace for capsule lift. Copy that. Bracing for capsule lift. Great news. All preparations for rigging have been completed with that confirmation of the comms there. So we should see Dragon start to lift out of the water here in just a few seconds. And the recovery teams are now preparing to lower the vessel's hydraulic lift mechanism into the water uh, to bring the spacecraft into the on-deck translation system known as the deck. Dragon will remain in, known as the nest, um, and Dragon will remain in this nest during the crew extraction and then for the journey back into port. So here momentarily, we will see the capsule being lifted and set on the nest. It will then be centered and oriented and then translated into the hangar underneath the helipad aboard the ship so that we can open up the hatch. And once open, a SpaceX medical doctor will be the first one to check in on Chell, Bob, Jessica, and Samantha and see if they are ready for egress or getting out. And you see that motion underway now as Dragon is lifted into the nest. This is a very cool view and cool process as we lift the Dragon vehicle and you can see the nest there that it's going to be sat down into. While Dragon's top hatch is used to connect the connect to the space station, the astronauts will egress from the Dragon's side hatch uh, pending capsule orientation in the water. Now, before opening the hatch, the spacecraft's cabin pressure must be equalized with the outside environment. Once the hatch is opened, that will be the crew's first breath of fresh air since boarding Dragon at the start of their mission back in April. 
So it is important to note that Chell, Bob, Jessica, and Samantha will be getting some assistance from the recovery team while they are exiting the capsule. This is the same process for any returning long duration crew members as returning to a gravity environment can wreak havoc with our vestibular system responsible for maintaining balance and motion. And of course, safety is always our number one priority. So you'll see Chell, Bob, Jessica, and Samantha helped out of the capsule and assisted the few feet to the medical quarters aboard the boat. And if you've ever watched crews return on a Soyuz mission, this is the same process as when astronauts are carried from the capsule to waiting chairs and then carried to a waiting medical tent. So it looks like we are getting views now of Dragon in the nest, successfully lifted up out of the water. And so once the crew egresses the capsule, um, this is a period where any time critical cargo can also be recovered from the spacecraft with um, the remainder waiting. Frida, SpaceX, welcome aboard the recovery vessel. Recovery personnel are going to be completing final checks and stand by for translation to the egress platform. Freedom copies. Great news there as Dragon sits in the nest there. And you did hear some comms. What they're going to do is once they derig this, they will slide the Dragon vehicle to a platform where the astronauts can easily exit uh, that side hatch there. And for those of you that might be just joining us, we did have crew four successfully undock from the International Space Station just about five hours ago. Um, and they splashed down at 1.55 p.m. Pacific time. All went as expected through the deorbit burn and the parachutes deployed as expected. The capsule is now lifted onto the boat and we are standing by for the translation to occur. Um, and once that translation um, moves the Dragon capsule up underneath the helicopter pad, um, the recovery team will then be able to work on um, opening up the hatch and removing the crew from the capsule. Crew 4 did splash down just about 30 minutes ago and is now already on the recovery vessel. The recovery vessel being used today is uh, named Megan after Crew 2 astronaut Megan MacArthur. So we are standing by for that translation maneuver to occur. You can see on the recovery vessel the platform that they will translate the Dragon vehicle to. You saw the view earlier. The hatch is uh, slightly above ground level, so that platform will allow the crew to exit the vehicle. Again, if you are just now joining us, the Crew 4 crew is now back on planet Earth. 
They are still inside of their seats and suits inside of that dragon capsule that you see there on your screen. And so after this translation maneuver occurs, uh, the next steps will be for the folks on the recovery vessel that are specialized in opening up that side hatch uh, that will begin that process. Now we have mentioned that we do have medical doctors on board that will help take care of the crew after the hatch opening and will conduct a series of initial checks um, before they are flown by helicopter back to shore. The recovery vessel, as you can imagine, takes quite a bit of time to get out um, into the splashdown zone. So the crew is flown um, off of the vehicle on helicopters and then take um, aircraft and fly um, back home to Houston for our three NASA astronauts on board. And then for our ESA astronaut on board, uh, Samantha Christopheretti, she'll head back to Europe. And the crew has been out in space on the International Space Station for about six months. Uh, they do get to work out while they're out on the space station, working out in microgravity. Um, but that is why the medical team is there, to make sure that they are safe and healthy, make sure that they are able to uh, adjust to gravity. Uh, it's probably a, a pretty big adjustment being uh, gone from gravity for such a long period of time. So the medical team will be there to make sure that they can exit the vehicle safely and then we'll do some uh, private medical checks with each of the individuals. And I'm loving these views here of the recovery vessel. Um, we don't often get to see this because sometimes uh, it is nighttime uh, depending on uh, when undocking and splashdown does happen for the crew members. So this is a pretty nice treat to get to see this great view. And you can see the helicopter pad on top of the recovered vessel there that Sandra was mentioning. There will be a helicopter that comes and lands there shortly once the crew is uh, or has egressed the Dragon vehicle and is ready to fly back uh, to land and then take a uh, another flight on a plane to Houston with Samantha taking flight back to Europe. And it looks like we are seeing that translation maneuver underway. And coming up next, once this translation maneuver is complete, the crew on board will begin to open up that side hatch. And as you can see from this view inside Crew Dragon Freedom, it looks like the crew does have their visors. It's kind of hard to tell from this angle if they're up or down, um, but when they egress from the capsule, we do expect those visors to be up. It'll be their first breath of fresh air in 170 days since they launched uh, back in April. And we were seeing some views of the personnel on the recovery vessel who are specialized in opening up that hatch, begin to get everything ready to begin that process. So we do expect hatch opening um, to come just a short time from now.
And once that hatch is open, we'll see the footrests actually be removed um, before the crew egresses. And that's really just to help make egressing a little bit easier. And now a great view on the left of the crew that's still inside Freedom, but not for long. And on the right-hand side is the recovery vessel. You can see the Crew Dragon Freedom tucked underneath the helicopter pad there after that translation maneuver, which occurred just a couple of minutes ago. Also, to, prior to hatch opening, the pressure inside of the cabin must be equalized with the outside environment, so that is also happening at this moment. Up oh, and... Freedom, SpaceX, side hatch open. And the side hatch is open. These recovery personnel are the first people the crew has seen on Earth um, since their launch day. Uh, and that those folks they saw on that day were the, the closeout crew who closed the hatch um, back in April. I believe that is the flight surgeon there briefing the crew, welcoming the crew, as well as briefing them for the next steps in the operation. Now that the side hatch is open, the recovery personnel are going to work to remove those footrests. And then after that, we should see the crew begin to egress the capsule. I believe they are removing those footrests. It looks like they grabbed all four of them. Some smiles, thumbs up. Looks like they're feeling pretty, pretty good. So we are standing by for the egress of crew four. They will exit the capsule one at a time. And also getting a nice welcome home photo in. And as the crew exits, you might be able to um, see a stretcher in the view that is perfectly n normal and expected. It's part of the um, nominal procedure. As we mentioned, the crew will be taken to medical facilities. So this is really just all part of the standard procedure that we do for any crew return. Yes, again, they have been out in space in microgravity for about six months. Uh, so they may need some assistance adjusting back to gravity here back on Earth. So I did hear that there's a special guest on board um, looking to welcome crew four back to Earth. Um, in fact, it's the namesake for the vessel that they are on. Uh, NASA astronaut Megan MacArthur there in your screen with the with on the left of your screen um, in the hat you can have a, a view of her here um, on the left of your screen here. Uh, she's. I'm sure looking forward to welcoming the crew back to Earth. That's really awesome to have her on board. 
especially the vessel that they named, uh, that we named uh, after her. Absolutely. So it looks like they're continuing to remove those footrests ahead of egress. You can see there is a crew member there helping to remove the harness, the umbilicals, and make sure that the crew is ready to get out of their seat and exit or egress the Dragon vehicle. And once the crew does egress, they'll take part in those medical checks. And then after that, they will board helicopters where they will fly back to shore, at which point they will um, board a plane and fly back to the Ellington Airport just outside of the Johnson Space Center in Houston. And then for our ESA, our European Space Agency astronaut, Samantha Cristoforetti, she'll head back to, to Europe. And so from this view over the shoulder of the crew, kind of looking behind the crew um, from left to right, we can't see her right now, but on the farthest left is European Space Agency astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti. And then in the view on the left of your screen is the commander of Crew Dragon Freedom, NASA astronaut Chell Lindgren. To his right, which we can see on our screen, is NASA astronaut Bob Hines. And then to his right, again, we can't see her um, just yet, but we will in a moment here once they egress, is NASA astronaut Jessica Watkins. Now, this was the first flight for Bob Hines and Jessica Watkins. Uh, both Samantha and Chell had flown previously. I also believe you mentioned a pretty cool fun fact about Samantha being um, having one of the longest amount of time out in space, correct? Yeah, that's right. So Samantha Cristoforetti now is second in the running for longest space flight by any woman. Um, she has totaled 369 days in space over her two flights, and she is second only to um, now retired NASA astronaut Peggy Whitson. Looks like the first to exit their seat is pilot Bob Hines. And so again, you do see that stretcher to the left of the screen there that is all part of our standard procedures looks like we're getting some claps and cheers for bob hines first out of crew dragon freedom <laughs> <laughs> and a high five to Megan MacArthur.
And so as we just saw, Bob Hines was the very first uh, to exit or egress the capsule. He spent a total of 170 days in space. This was his very first space flight. And it looks like next up we will have uh, the commander, Chell Lindgren, who will exit the capsule. This is his second space flight. Um, he's logged a total of 311 days in space. Chell Lindgren is now outside of Crew Dragon Freedom. <laughs> Some great smiles and waves there. A big high five to NASA <laughs> astronaut Megan MacArthur. Recovery personnel now working to get Jessica Watkins ready to egress. So just five hours ago, this vehicle was docked to the International Space Station, and now we have two of the four crew members having been removed after a successful splashdown. We are standing by for another first-time flyer, Jessica Watkins, as she is egressed from the capsule. And there she is, NASA astronaut Jessica Watkins, standing up for the first time in about six months. And the final crew member that will be removed is European Space Agency astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti, who after this mission has logged 369 days in space over her two flights, which again, that does make her the second on the all-time list for most days in space by a woman. And that is second to NASA's Peggy Whitson, who logged 665 days in space over her three space flights.
There is Issa Astronaut, Samantha Cristoforetti, now egress from the Dragon vehicle, the final crew member of Crew 4 to exit the vehicle. Well, now that Chell Lindgren, Bob Hines, Jessica Watkins, and Samantha Cristoforetti are safely back home on Earth and getting checked out by the NASA medical team. We're going to wrap up our live coverage of the return. This all kicked off on April 27th from historic launch pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. After a successful liftoff and separation from Falcon 9, Chell, Bob, Jessica, and Samantha made a 16-hour flight on board Dragon to the International Space Station. Since arriving at the space station, they spent nearly six months as members of Expedition 67 and 68, executing science experiments, spacewalks, and repairs while aboard the orbiting laboratory. And their journey home began earlier today, October 14th, when they closed the hatch to Dragon and undocked from the International Space Station at 9.05 a.m. Pacific time. After four successful departure burns and a phasing burn to line up their orbit, Chell, Bob, Jessica, and Samantha rested for a few hours before waking up to prepare for re-entry this morning. We jettisoned Dragon's trunk and performed our final on-orbit maneuver, the deorbit burn, at 1.01 p.m. GMT or Pacific time to send Dragon on the path home. The spacecraft re-entered the Earth's atmosphere and slowed its descent with successful deployments of two drug parachutes and four mains with the final splashdown occurring off the coast of Florida at 1.55 p.m. Pacific time. Now, following that successful splashdown, we saw SpaceX recovery ex experts move in and prepare Dragon Freedom for its lift onto the recovery vessel. And just a little less than an hour ago, following splashdown, we saw Chell, Bob, Jessica, and Samantha make their way out of Dragon into the recovery ship's medical facilities, safe and sound. And next up, they'll catch a helicopter flight back to shore where they'll transfer to aircraft that will take them home. Chell, Bob, and Jessica and Samantha will take a NASA plane for the short flight back to Houston, and Samantha will board a plane back to Europe after that. They'll be reunited with their families to bring an end to this successful mission. It's been an honor and a privilege to share their journey with all of you as we continue this new era in human spaceflight. Now, return today marks the end of the direct handover we just executed after successfully launching the Crew-5 mission to the space station just a little over a week ago. It has been an incredible honor and joy to share this mission with the public. All the teams from SpaceX and NASA continue to work hard to keep America leading the world in human spaceflight. Continue to follow SpaceX and NASA online and on social media for updates for the very latest on crew and cargo flights to and from the International Space Space Station. And we'll continue to share the progress of Chell, Bob, Jessica, and Samantha on social media as they travel back home. Now, we also do have a post splashdown media telecon coming up at approximately 3 30 p.m. Pacific time, 6 30 p.m. Eastern, where leadership from NASA, ESA, and SpaceX will share a final update as we conclude this successful mission. So we'll say thanks one more time for tuning in and cheering on Chell, Bob, Jessica, and Samantha. Samantha as they made their return back to planet Earth from all of us at NASA and SpaceX and ESA. Welcome home, Crew 4. So long.